You're watching a follow-up Friday episode for the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast, episode 62, with Jason Gabry about his book, Wait With Me. I'm Josh Havens. And I'm Chris Lamberth. And one of the things that makes this conversation that we had with Jason so spectacular was that we're dealing with an issue like loneliness, which is uh, a universal issue. We all experience this. That's right. (laughs) Everybody. Especially now in 2020. Now, again, I, I, I... Maybe this is a caveat that doesn't belong in this video, but it's not like 2020 is the worst year that's ever happened in human history, okay? So let's let's put that in perspective. Like, humanity has experienced many, many really hard times, and, and, and they experience loneliness in their own unique ways, and so uh, we are as well. So if for no other reason, this is how it connects. Um, <laughs> you are not alone because other people have gone through uh, similar or worse stuff than we are right now in 2020. See, there you go. It all connects. <laughs> <laughs> no, but loneliness, like, so, um, you know, we were talking about it or thinking about it. This episode has been uh, especially impactful for me. Um, I've dealt with loneliness in a very unique way, uh, unique in, in the sense of my life, uh, over the last four years. Um you know, after losing my mother, it has caused loneliness to be part of my life in a way that's, um, it's just, I've never known it before. So it, it, it's, it's different than, you know, being left out of a, a group or feeling like you're just uh, different than everybody else. You know, it just sort of leaves you with the sense of, you know, um, you know, literally people are going to leave you. <laughs> and so it, it just sort of heightens that you know, that whole fear center, um, within my life. And so I really appreciated a lot of what, um, Jason had to say in this episode, especially, you know, talking about like why there is loneliness, where loneliness comes from. But what I really appreciate about his, his book and our conversation is that loneliness doesn't have to be something that we look at like sin. And, and we, we don't have to get down on ourselves because we are lonely. And I feel like um, that's what a lot of us do. I know I have done that. You st- like loneliness can almost trigger a depressive episode just because you feel like um, there's something wrong with you because you feel lonely. Yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about that in the episode a little bit. If you're feeling lonely, it must mean that other people don't like you mm-hmm. because you have something wrong with you. Therefore, be depressed because you have something wrong with you. Be ashamed because nobody likes you. Yeah. And that is so far from the truth, the mm-hmm. reality of of life. I yeah. Mean, it's Well, I like I like the point that you you just made though that it also kind of builds on uh our conversation with Jeff and Sid Holsclaw is yeah. that like loneliness can lead to shame and shame often leads to sin. And so I think in that way, if we're not careful, loneliness can lead uh, to sinful actions in our life. But that doesn't mean that loneliness in and of itself is a sin or is a bad thing. Yeah, I would argue it leads to sin in the same way that hunger has the potential to lead to gluttony. Yeah, exactly. Um, In fact, in the episode, we did talk about uh, loneliness as a hunger. And I think that was one of the most impactful things for me personally, mm-hmm. really talking about loneliness as a lack of something in our lives, not a problem that we have. Mm-hmm. It's a lack. Yeah, and I like that. I liked that, uh, that analogy, uh, hunger, because um, we would never get down on ourselves for being physically uh, hungry. It's just, no. it's just a, a warning or a trigger. It just it tells you that something is going on. And so if you're feeling lonely, there's no reason to be ashamed of it. Just like you're not ashamed when it, you know, starts to become lunchtime and the preacher won't be quiet and let everybody, no, no, I'm just playing, (laughs) you know, but it's it's lunchtime, you get hungry. And so that's a perfectly normal thing. And, um, you know, loneliness triggers that kind of a response in us. And so um, like I've sort of started taking this then and I can look at loneliness. So if that's like 
the first thing. I think the second most impactful thing was this idea that, and he he put it like this, is that you can have a very healthy marriage and still feel lonely. And the reason is, is because uh, we we are multi-relationally faceted creatures. We have different kinds of relational needs that we need to get met. And so like marriage and intimacy is only one of those uh, categories. And so if you're feeling lonely, I think, it, the, again, the way that this has played out in my life over the last uh, couple of weeks is that I start to look for then in which relational area am I feeling lonely? Because then what what happens is we, if we feel lonely and th- we can become codependent in this way because yeah. we just have one go-to relationship that maybe we try, that's where we're trying to get all of our needs met. And it's, it's, we're just sort of digging a never ending hole here. And, and cause we're yeah. never really actually addressing uh, the real problem. Right. You know, it's, I, I think back on, on uh, my own married life and, and the married lives of others around me. And you see people who want to think that, a spouse should be able to give you everything relationally mm-hmm. that you need. And you can either put that pressure on your spouse mm-hmm. or you can put that pressure on yourself to be that to your spouse. That's true. And neither one of those are healthy. I mean, right after our conversation with Jason, we decided, yeah, we're going to go see a movie. Yep. I mean, it's been like months yeah. since we've actually at gone least to six. see a movie. At least six months since we've gone to see a movie. And... That's a part of my relationship with you mm-hmm. that I've missed out on in the last six, seven months. Actually, it's been more than that. So it's got to be at least a year, I think. It's Yeah, it's got to be close to that. It's been a long time. Because it's September right now. This was the first movie we watched <laughs> in 2020. So True it is. Uh, yeah, anyway, it's closer to a year. But you're right. And we talked about it in the episode, which was so cool that we were then you know, able to go and do that. There are some things in life that you cannot and should not get from your spouse relationally and there's no pressure to make that happen Mm -hmm. uh find ways to fill those relational needs with friends around you Mm -hmm. uh jason talked about in the in the episode uh uh, the relational need for a mentor or a coach or some kind of pastoral father figure we all need somebody like that that's right and in a way, for that for that kind of role to be filled by your spouse would uh, would be a little weird sometimes. Yeah, it would be because you know, I mean, and and this kind of gets down to the I guess the core uh, issue of like what these relationships entail and and what that you know in, in a spousal relationship. Although you will mentor each other in your own way, they're not they're meant to be of equals. Yeah. And if you go and listen to our podcast that we did with uh, our pastoral coach, uh, Pastor Alan Baker, you know, we talk about the needing the vertical relationships yeah. and the horizontal relationship. Well, a marriage relationship is a horizontal relationship. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we're meant to be equals sharing this journey together. And so uh, we will each need uh, different mentors in our life and we will each need to be a mentor to someone else in our lives. I think that's an important part. And it's it's step five in how to create a lifestyle of discipleship. Is to make other disciples. We need to be leading others along in the same journey that uh, we're currently engaged in. And and that's just a good, healthy, natural part of our lives. And if you if you feel like you're lonely or and especially unsatisfied, I think can be a good trigger that goes along with this. It might be because you're not giving back or you're not investing into uh, someone else adequately. And so you could feel like if you look around at all your relationships and you feel like, well, I mean, I'm doing pretty good. I got, I got friends. My, you know, my marriage is, is solid where we communicate. I don't feel like there's anything uh, lacking there. You know, I, I have a mentor and like, I, I would seriously think then that you should start looking at well, where are you giving back to others? And perhaps you need to be, uh, you know, contributing more, uh, in a relationship than you're receiving, and, and then that might be perhaps the relational area that you're a little lonely in. Yeah. I don't remember who it was that either told this story. I don't even remember if it was on the podcast or if I'm just reading it from a book somewhere. Uh, but it's a story of somebody who went to Mother Teresa and asked, uh, I keep dealing with all these same problems in my, in my thought life. I keep doing this and this, and it was all this inward stuff. Uh, and he asked her, how do I how do I get over this? And she basically told him, stop thinking about it 
and go serve some poor people. Yeah. <laughs> because we get so caught up in our own interior world sometimes uh, that we forget that we're wired for community and mm-hmm. relationships with other people. And we can even do that in the relationships, like you're saying, with other people, where we focus on so much receiving that we forget to do that reciprocal giving yes. part of the, the relationship as well. And that's so important. Yeah, and it, and it sounds like, to me, this is like one of those weird, tricky things where it could sound like you're saying something that you're definitely not saying, um, where it's kind of like, you know, sometimes you just need to be obedient to Jesus. Like, if he's asked you to do something, like, just do it. Like, that's not a legalistic way of approaching it, though, just to simply obey. That's, that's literally an act of faith, even though you might not feel like it or you might not understand it. And I, and I, I would put this in that same kind of category. You're right. Mother Teresa said that. And I've heard that from other um, people in, in books that I've read and, and done the exact same thing. Is It's like sometimes you just actually have to give of yourself to find the thing that you're actually looking for. If you want it, you have to give it. <laughs> yeah. And so it's 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 a it's a weird paradoxical thing, but um that's like we are relational beings, like you're saying, and we're wired for that. I think it is important to find what kind of relationship you're actually hungry for. And that's I think something that's not often easy to do, uh, if we want to use the analogy of actual hunger. I mean, sometimes your body has a really great way of telling you what kind of nutrients it needs. Mm -hmm. Like every once in a while, I just get a craving for citrus. Yeah. And I've come to realize, yep, my vitamin C is probably getting a little low right now. Yep. Uh, And so you- Same thing with sugar cravings as well. Yeah. Your body tells you what kind of things it wants Mm -hmm. in the way that it, it prompts you to eat certain foods. So if you find yourself- hungry for relationships, you find yourself lonely, look for the things that you're actually desiring to, to feel or to receive or to, what what kind of things interest you at the moment? Mm -hmm. What kind of things are catching your attention and and pulling you forward? So like, for example, if uh, Chris and I are at work and we've been going nonstop for nine plus months and all we want is to not have the pressure of work. Maybe we're hungry for a little movie time. That's where, right. Where that pressure is gone. And what we're really looking for is a friend to just enjoy that kind of a time with. That's right. We're not looking for a coworker to hang out mm-hmm. with. We're looking for just a friend. And this this really reminds me of Charles oh. Duhigg's uh, <laughs> The Power of Habit. Um, in here, he talks about a similar way of discovering like your bad habits and because often what we do is we conflate um I'll, I'll just give an example rather than try to explain it it's the uh the afternoon craving for a cookie or you know a candy bar or chips or something like that um so like you know two o'clock rolls around boom you think i've got to go and i've got to get my my treat um really though if you start to like maybe write that down you write okay you start noticing the pattern okay at two o'clock i normally have this and i and i go and i so you just sort of observe what you're doing what's sort of the thing that's triggering this and then you start to write down well how do you feel afterwards And then you can start – so once you kind of have an understanding of what you're doing, you can then start to uh, subvert it, put other things in. Okay, so instead of going to the vending machine, maybe instead I go to a friend's office and I chat for 15 minutes. If I come back to my office and I feel perfectly fine, I'm ready to go on with my day, it starts to tell you something. Maybe you're not actually hungry. Maybe you're just needing a break and you need to go and connect with someone. Or if you go for a walk, for instance, or there's a bunch of different things that you can do. It's reminding, this is what I'm thinking of when we're talking about looking at those different areas of your life um, for what kind of relational needs you might have. And I would encourage you to then um, start keeping a journal on that. If If there are certain hungers, you probably aren't aware of them. And so writing is like one of the best practices for really being able to uh, dig around in your own brain and figure out just really what you're thinking. And so write some of that stuff down and, and, and like, how are you feeling? Why, why do you want to do certain activities? If you're, you know, wanting to go hiking or something like that, or like, you know, sometimes for me, like, you know, I just got to get into the woods. And so I think sometimes that can maybe mean I need to go and have fun with people 
but it also might mean I need to be alone and I'm searching for solitude and, and silence and, and, and the wilderness and hiking uh, represents that for me. And so like, as you write that down, I think you'll be able to explore those things and sort of, you know, figure out systematically in a way of what kind of a relationship you're actually looking for. I think one of the most important points from, uh, Jason's book. I mean, it's really in his subtitle, Meeting God in Loneliness. Uh, I think this was the final point for me that was really impactful. We often don't look at Jesus as knowing what it means to be lonely. Mm -hmm. And we think of our loneliness as something that we have to get over so that we can be in relationship with him. And the Part of the the main argument in this book is use your loneliness as a context for entering into relationship and friendship with Jesus. That's a powerful and a liberating thought because now all of a sudden loneliness is not something that you have to avoid or satisfy. It's a context for entering into relationship with God. Yes. It can drive you to seek that out in a way that you didn't think that you needed before. And again, I think that becomes uh, an extremely profound way. And it, on one hand, like, and I, I, as I've been thinking about this, I don't want it to sound like a kind of a cliche. Well, you're lonely, go to God. You know, yeah. everybody knows that, right? I mean, that's sort of, there's like a Sunday school answer, you know, surface level thing. But this is like, if you're looking at this, I, again, as a hunger, like, there's something that you're genu- that there's something in your life that's genuinely missing that needs to be satisfied. Um, this itself can provide a habitual trigger so that you can go to Jesus, the one who satisfies all of our hungers ultimately. And so um, it, God satisfies our hungers, though, you know, he's our physical hunger through food. He satisfies our relational hungers uh, through other people. But ultimately, he is that satisfaction that we're looking at. And so if we can avoid the uh, like, like you were talking about, the like gluttonous, um, you know, recognizing where Christ is, even in the midst of our physical hunger uh, for food, helps keep those natural passions, that natural hunger in check so that it doesn't just run rampant in our life and destroy Mm -hmm. us through the, you know, the mortal sin of gluttony and and, and the same thing with like codependent relationships as well. We can, we can latch onto people, um, in such a way that our entire identities can start being defined by them, or we retreat from all relationships into that loneliness. And then that in turn starts to define our identities. But if we, if we allow that hunger to say, this is actually there to draw me closer to Christ in my relationship with him, then that hunger, I mean, that hunger that is loneliness is actually a really good thing. It's, it's there to tell you something profound about yourself. And maybe it, you just need to spend a little bit more time uh, with Christ and seeking uh, relationships with other people in Christ. Like, mm-hmm. that's the other thing that, you know, and he really brought that up. And I love the way he talked about praying for other people as yeah. if you were just sitting on a bench um, with Jesus. And instead of asking Jesus to do everything for that guy, it's you're really more having a conversation and saying, Lord, where does he need you? How can I be uh, your hands and feet to him right now? And it's really more, it's, it's a relational aspect that you're taking then um, with Christ in your other relationships. And I'm still trying to chew on that one because it's a different relational way of praying um, that I haven't, I just haven't done like that, mm-hmm. quite frankly. And uh, I, I feel a little foolish now because I'm, I kind of feel like that should be the obvious way of praying, like, you know, but well, it brings a unity between your individual prayer and your walking with someone. It brings unity and kind of a dual purpose between steps two and three and creating a lifestyle of discipleship, yeah. which is really cool. It is. It, it, and, and <laughs> go figure. It's bringing Christ into your life <laughs> as a natural part of that thing. You're creating a lifestyle of discipleship by doing it. And so I think that's an incredible, incredible uh, way of looking at loneliness and how loneliness can actually lead you 
into a deeper walk with Christ. So I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. We love having them. Man, we always learn so much from our guests. Um, so let us know what you think. Comment down below. Did you listen to Jason Gabriel's episode? And uh, if so, uh, how has loneliness impacted you? And what are you doing now as a result of listening to the podcast? Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Like and subscribe. Turn on the bell notification. And YouTube will let you know each time a new video goes live. Thanks for going on this journey with us as we strive to create a lifestyle of discipleship.